Welcome um, everybody back to um, Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center of CUNY in uh, New York City. It's week five of Friday. Um, I feel that everybody feels uh, the weight uh, of those weeks behind us, especially at the end of a week. Uh, we have uh, days that are um, surprisingly full, surprisingly quiet. Uh, New York state and New York City is not doing well. Um, there are suggestions that the actual death rate is over 20,000. Uh, we still don't have vaccinations. We don't have testings. Everything is closed. The city is closed. Um, artists um, are out of work, lots of them for a year ahead, musicians, uh, actors, uh, dancers. So um, it's something we share with the world. Perhaps the first time we are really virally connected in a sense we have never thought about. And uh, it's a serious time, uh, but it's also a time for reflection, a time to think. We yesterday had on uh, Peter Sellers, who uh, shared with us him, his thoughts, um, what that he feels strongly things have to change, they have to be different. The environment is getting back to us and giving us a warning. And that we also should use this time to, to listen. And um, this is what this talk is about. We really listen to the voices of artists, which we always do at the Siegel Center, where we often bridge academia and professional international and American theater. But they are significant voices, important voices, and they have been on the right side of history, on the right side of social justice, and on the right side of being on the right side. Today, we have uh, the New York component of our week. Most of the four of them are international global talks from everywhere, from Egypt to Hong Kong, uh, China, from uh, uh, Poland, uh, uh, Germany, Italy, and many, many more. Um, but this is our New York segment. We have two representatives from the New York uh, theater scene, two significant voices, the great Oscar Eustace from the public theater, which she runs the public theater, normally an institution with 250 people just working there. All doors are closed, Joe Papp, get it. If I remember right out of the hand of a, it was a kind of Jewish welfare organization, was a city building and he had that vision and created what's called the public theater for the public. And now the public doesn't have a theater at the moment, it's closed, but the building is there. And also with us is the great Tony Torn, who is a part also of the landscape of the New York theater scene, especially the experimental one going back to the Reza Abdu days, his exceptional work, but also carrying on over uh, decades as we work and he hosts and runs one of the smallest, perhaps the smallest theater with 20 seats or 30 in his home um, uh, downtown where he equates. So uh, these are opposites in it, but somehow they are connected. So both of you, um, welcome. Thank you for taking the time. We know how much you work, how much you have on your mind, Oscar and Tony. So Oscar, so um, what's going on? How do you feel? How you're sitting at the, the desk looking at a screen and ask, being asked to talk about the public. Yeah, it's a, a, a difficult time. Uh, it's a difficult time to talk about because it's a difficult time that we're all in. And we at the public have our particular set of pains and obstacles and, you know, uh, suffering. But it, we're not exceptional in that. Everybody is going through variations on this theme and we have the epidemiological crisis but of course we also have the economic crisis that is right on its heels and is going to have an enormous impact on our work so we are trying day by day to make the best decisions we can about that so how do you feel you're also an artist your director your dramaturg one of the great ones and um so how, how do how do you feel as a person at the moment it's hard. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, I'm healthy. Um, I had a bout with the thing, but I'm over it and I, I feel good. I'm here with my wife and daughter. So you said you had the virus? Yeah. Um, I was oh, I didn't know that. hospitalized mid-March for- You were hospitalized? Years, I had you know. no idea. And uh, uh, it was bad, but I recovered. Uh, I'm lucky. And uh, I'm with my wife and daughter here in Brooklyn. And the fact that we're together is really, really great. So in that way, I feel very privileged and blessed. And on the other hand, I'm running the theater, which is facing enormous economic challenges, enormous artistic challenges. And I suspect like most of us, a lot of what I'm spending my time doing is trying to figure out what my responsibility is and what's the best possible way that I can live up to those responsibilities in this moment and planning for the moments to come. And 
it's hard, but you know, it's, that's my job. Hmm. So if possible, tell us a bit, how did you find out you had the virus and what happened? How many days were you in the hospital and how did it feel like? I was in the hospital for four days and um, I actually cannot promise you I had the virus because of course we're in New York and not in an advanced country like South Korea. So we didn't have the test when I was in the hospital, but all signs indicate from both the symptoms and everything else that I, that I had uh, COVID-19. Um, I was uh, in bad shape uh, for four days, but uh, once I was released and seemed to be recovering within 10 days, two weeks, I was pretty much back to normal. So you had the fever and the muscle aches and fever uh, and coughing. The, the intense muscle weakness. That's That was the most distinctive part about it. It was just sort of mind blowing how weak I was. Um, and then I was dying. I had some heart problems that is what they actually admitted me for uh, that stem from low potassium, which now new studies are suggesting that low potassium is one of the indicators of COVID. So, but mm. my, my personal, I, I, I've had it so much better. I yeah. Have the privilege compared to so many others that uh, I don't feel like I have anything to complain about in that regard. But still your life, uh, was in danger. What did go through your mind? Uh, I was actually too tired to uh, be worried, um, which is maybe a, a natural blessing that illness sometimes bring. I was so exhausted. I, I had no anxiety at all. I just wanted to get some sleep and feel better. And uh, the biggest worry, actually the biggest observation I had is that this is almost six weeks ago now, the hospital that I was in here in Brooklyn was overwhelmed at that point. And clearly you could feel that they were not able to keep up with the, I spent the night in a hallway. They were not able to keep up with the flood of patients. And that was six weeks ago. So um, our frontline workers are heroic. Our government is shameful, particularly our federal government for the lack of support that they provided to the hospitals and the people who are actually bearing the brunt of this. And uh, at seven o'clock every day, I'm out on the street cheering and applauding for the frontline workers in this health crisis because they are taking risks they shouldn't have to be taking and they're being selfless in an extraordinary way. Incredible. So you spent a night in the hallway of a Brooklyn hospital. Did you think at all about art, theater? Did something come to your mind? Are you saying this is not, wasn't the moment? It was well, something that... Yeah, I mean, I thought about it. I was actually in the hospital over the period of time where we shut down the theater. I was admitted on the 10th of March and we shut down the theater as all theaters shut down on the 12th, 13th of March. So I was actually not uh, available to make that decision. Although there was not much of a decision to be made. We were just doing what was necessary. Uh, but I came out of the hospital into this strange new world where not only did we have to shut down all of our operations, but the entire community I'm part of, and essentially I live my life as a member of the New York theater community, everyone, who was not connected to an institution was instantly unemployed. And of course, for most of the colleagues that I work with, they were not only unemployed from the theater, but their side gigs in restaurants and bars also shut down. So the level of um, anxiety and economic trouble that is flowing through the New York theater community right now is enormous. And uh, one of the things, I've, again, I spent a lot of time thinking about is what can we as an institution do to try to buffer that or support those people or not just keep our own institution alive, but keep the rainforest, the ecology of the New York theater community alive because we all live in that ecology and no institution can survive if that entire ecosystem doesn't survive. Yeah, and incredible how <clears throat> your personal life and then the life of the theater you work in, but also the life of the city kind of um, intertwined as one of the flagships of American theater, certainly also of New York theater, also next to Lincoln Center Theater as the big institution. Um, and I can only imagine what it means to be responsible for, as you said, 200 to 250 people. And for sure, you will not be able to have everybody um, on for the next year. Um, Tony, how, how, how is it for you? How did, uh, when did you hear first about it? And w when did it hit you that it will change well, your life as an artist? Well, I was very aware of what was going on, of course. And I was, uh, I was traveling to uh, Boston every week. I was teaching up there at MIT. So I was taking Amtrak right through the corridor of where all the cases were first showing up. 
So when uh, we shut down there, <clears throat> I was uh, actually getting ready to uh, go and join, join my uh, brother and sister uh, at a celebration for my father, uh, Rip Torn, in Mexico. And that morning when I was packing- he passed I away, could, right, last year. Yeah, he passed away last year. And so we were, I was about to head out there, I was packing to go to the airport, and I just felt terrible. And so I canceled the trip, and I stayed at home for three weeks in New York. Hmm. And, uh, I actually managed to get a test because I'd been staying with an elderly friend um, while I was in Boston. I really wanted to make sure that she was safe. So I was able to convince uh, my doctor to sign me up on the first tests that were available. And I tested negative, but it took me a week and a half to find out. So I thought, well, I have plenty of time to have caught the virus since. But anyway, I'm doing fine. I'm uh, here with my family and uh, very, very grateful to be healthy and safe, uh, you know, and uh, looking forward to the future and seeing what comes next for all of us. Um, New York theater is a special, as you said, tone, Oscar said, ecosystem in a way, a Galapagos Island where things develop, they don't develop in other islands. And it is an island after all, uh, Manhattan. Um, what do you all think what will it mean for New York theater, what we're going through now? Tony, you want to take Chris Crab? Yeah, sure. You know, it's um, New York, uh, you know, happens to be a very, very special uh, community center for theater makers. And, uh, you know, um, Oscars Theater and what I do, I mean, Oscars, uh, the public theater, we so beautifully called the public theater, uh, is, uh, you know, a great institution for the public that can see it up to a thousand people a night. I do private events in a private space for 30 people or less. But what connects them is they're both community places. The uh, public theater has always been uh, really at the forefront of making their theater community space for everybody. And that's what uh, Torn Pages, we have lots of different communities. There's poetry communities, theater communities, filmmaking communities, all moving through our little place where they can uh, share work with people. And so um, that's, that's, the, um, that's the flow. That's what it's all about. It's about community. And right now we're trying to figure out a way to keep the communities connected when you can't be in the same space. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, things will change. There will be uh, an evolution in the way we do things. We will be able to gather again in some way in the future, but we don't know what that will be. We don't know um, how soon that will be. And uh, there's lots of things we're all working on to keep creative and keep connected. Um, a lot of us have been doing uh, work on Zoom and I just watched uh, the beautiful piece that they're doing at the public, uh, the Richard Nelson piece, uh, what do we need to talk about? It's a gorgeous example of how um, actors can contribute into sort of a new form, the sort of Zoom performance thing uh, that a lot of us have been involved with. Uh, but it's interesting, it's, it's, it's a great thing to have while we're waiting for theater to return, but is it theater? I'm not sure. So I'm looking forward to how theater will reemerge, the very essential aspect of theater, which is the live people in a room together. So um, that's something to evolve towards, but we're all doing our best to keep connected. And I think uh, that's the main thing is to try to keep the communities moving forward. You know, I'd say, I, I can't say I agree with everything that Tony said. And actually, let me jump off of one thing you said, Tony, because the notion of the community and our awareness of the role we play within a community, I think is also the big delta about which direction the whole culture goes. Because in this time of crisis, in this time of economic crisis and medical crisis, ecological crisis, we either are going to continue the lurch towards authoritarianism, nationalism, xenophobia, wall building that the world has really been caught up in for the last few years from the United States to Great Britain, to Russia, to Hungary, to India, all over the world, nationalists and xenophobes have taken control of, of governments. And we're either gonna continue in that direction, which means that A, humanity will be doomed and I'm fairly, fairly sure that if humanity is doomed, it won't be good for the theater. And, or we are going to go 
in another direction, which is a direction of understanding our responsibilities to each other, a community impulse that is broader and deeper than we have previously had. I don't think things are going to stay the same. Um, we've already seen reactions from the federal government, from Congress anyway, with the payroll protection plan that is the most aggressive intervention in just providing jobs and wages for people that we've had since the Great Depression. And like the period of the Great Depression, what we saw then was the world split into those who on the one hand went towards an authoritarian nationalist route and those who on the other went towards what the New Deal became, which is a way of trying to become a more egalitarian society. I think the theater has a really crucial role to play in that. I think the theater's role in advocating for that greater sense of community responsibility is going to be very important. Uh, and I also think the theater will only thrive if that's the direction the culture leans in response to this, in response to this crisis, that we agree that we're in a shared journey, a shared burden, and we need to share both the burdens and the joys of what has come. I'm sorry, that's kind of high flute and grandiose, but I really believe it. I don't think the theater will look the same way when we're done with this. I think that either we will be more inclusive or we will be less relevant. I know it's maybe too early to ask, but if you say more inclusive, you already are so inclusive. Also the outreach with Joe's pop and Shakespeare in the park, uh, the Shakespeare mobile, but what would be more inclusive? Are, you, are things going through your mind? Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things <clears throat> Tony referenced Richard Nelson's play, uh, What Do We Need to Talk About? Um, which we, it's our first completely quarantine created production. Richard wrote the play in the last month. Uh, we rehearsed it and put it on Thursday night. And we've had 25,000 views in the last 36 hours, which is extraordinary reach for us. So part of me thinks that this, this being forced into this digital sphere might have some discoveries and blessings and positive matters. We might find ways that the work of the public can extend over a broader geographical reach. I know that, what, that when we come back, it's gonna be into a time of some economic deprivation. There's no question that the economy is not gonna magically bounce back. We're gonna have serious unemployment issues. We're gonna have serious economic issues. And at that moment, resources will be scarcer. And if the theater is going to thrive, the theater is going to have to, and I particularly count my kind of theater, which is supposed to be a big, broad, populist theater. We have to make the case for why we matter. We have to make the case for why we're improving people's lives in a very powerful and direct way. Or I, um, I think we won't deserve to uh, thrive in the coming world. So, you know, for us, it's both about, um, you know, possible digital outreach. It's about uh, we, we have a mobile unit, but I think everything we do needs to become mobile. I think we start need to start moving outside of our building on a very regular basis, because we know we have the numbers and the metrics that the only programs we do where the audience exactly matches the demographics of New York City are our mobile unit productions. When we go to where people are, we're reaching everybody. When we expect them to come to our building, we're immediately diminishing the number of people we reach. We had started a national outreach program, the National Mobile Project, uh, where we toured last year, Lynn not just sweat through Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, in rural communities. I think we're going to need to continue that. I think we need to, um, you know, whether the, the public is a big theater that's supposed to have a big populist audience, uh, Tony's is a much more intimate community. But for whatever community we're serving, I think we have to demonstrate what's necessary about us and we have to look at ourselves deeply and say do we actually have something to offer to here to to offer right now and if we don't maybe we should shut up but if we do how do we offer it in a way that's most effective if someone would talk to both of you they say why are we needed but what, what do you feel is the the, the real reason why is theater needed? Why is art needed for when New York will coming back? Besides, of course, the other, but what is, what, what is your deep convic conviction inside of you? Why we have to be present? Can I hear well, um, well, just think about what we are missing right now. What we're missing right now in <clears throat> social isolation, social distancing, lockdown. 
um, you know, we have these, you know, in terms of people who, um, um, who art is like nourishment is like food. Um, we have, and, you know, we can see amazing films on, you know, um, from the history of cinema, we can read books, we can engage in this strange new beast of uh, Zoom performance, which um, is something with very in interesting individual aspects, which I we might get into later. But what are we missing? We're missing, um, we're missing being in a room with people. And, uh, you know, let's not forget the essential uh, beauty of that and the essential um, nourishment we get from being in an actual community. And there are some people thinking that we may never be able to do that again, which I think is, we, I think that there's a need for human beings to connect with others outside of a, a mediated realm. And that's what theater offers. You know, for, um, I love multimedia theater, but it, you know, in the end, I think the important thing is not to try to recreate a, uh, like a film experience or um, a sort of a, a sculptural experience. Though if you wanna use those things to enhance the live aspect, fine. But the main thing about theater is you're actually in the room. It's actually happening now. And uh, there are aspects of that that can be borrowed by something like the Zoom experience. But I, I think that we're gonna come out of this hungry, thirsty, starving to be in that live connected experience. So uh, we just have to find a way forward to be able to offer that to people again. And I think that there's just a holistic aspect of theater that is unmatched by any other life, by any other art form. And, uh, you know, on top of that, everything that Oscar says about our mission, our social mission is 100% true. But that's on top of the, what I think is this, the spiritual need of theater is to be connected in real time with real people in a real place. That's, that's beautifully said, Tony. And the only thing I'd add to it is the other thing that the theater provides in a civic way is it's the only place where routinely groups of strangers come together who don't necessarily agree already on any ideology and watch stories that are profound and deep, celebratory, painful, all of the different gamut of what the theater can cover. The churches or other gathering sites, those are people who are pre-selected that they agree with each other. But the theater, when you come together, you don't have to agree with the people next to you. You can completely disagree with them. They can be completely different than you. But then together you watch a story and the act of being live, and Tony's absolutely right, nothing replaces it, means that your laughter is more satisfying if 30 or 100 or 1,000 people are laughing with you. Your tears are more moving if you hear other people crying with you, or if everybody's dead silent, not wanting to miss what's going to happen next. What happens in that collective audience thing is that we are reminded on a visceral level of how much we have in common with each other. We, are, we, we actually experience the sense that what I find funny, so do a lot of other people. What I find moving, so do a lot of other people. And by doing that, I think it reinforces the idea that again, we have more in common with each other than we have distinct from each other. And that in this age when the social media is letting people silo their experiences into pre-selected echo chambers where all they hear are opinions they already agree with, I think that's going to be more important than ever to have to let this kind of storytelling remind us of, of what we have in common. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> it's uh, 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 like in fasting in a way you don't eat, but you think constantly about what I do that <laughs> once a week every year and uh, it's healthy and you, you taste differently, you say it smells differently, but um, it, it's an argument that New York politicians will have to go through. Do I give money to the Heard Nothing unit? Will I give it to uh, care for um, pregnant women or for uh, what's needed, midwives, uh, getting health insurance? Or we say we give it for productions, for the opera, for, for musicals and, and, and things. So these are really big questions. And they, we really have to ask ourselves, you know, what is it really good for what we do? And, um, and, and especially in New York City, 
often uh, lots of people do say it wasn't really great before yet. Some things weren't working. Is it a chance to rebuild, repair something or reconnect or do something new? Well, if I could just jump in because Frank, the, the way I would not phrase the question that politicians have to decide whether to give money to nursing facilities or to the theater. That's the way the right wing wants us to pose the question. Exactly, yeah. But what the real question is, is are we going to make a commitment as a society to fund the things that are good for everybody? And that includes hospitals and that includes theaters, or are we going to let the rich keep their privately held money close to themselves? That's the question. Is, is, are we a society devoted to the common good or are we a society devoted to the accumulation of individual wealth and the knocking down of any restrictions or redistribution that may come to that world? And that, I think if we weigh in on the side of we have to become more inclusive, we have to become more egalitarian, we have to treat and think more about the common good as a society, that will have implications in everything from taxation to social policy. And I don't want to let us get pitted in a competition with hospitals uh, as if it's a zero sum game. It's not a zero sum game. Yeah, access to uh, education, the arts and health, they're Absolutely. basic human rights and they have to coexist and actually connect to each other. They are given, it's a great society. They are indicators but um, um, and Tony, I, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if anybody read uh, Gabriel Hamilton's um, article about the closing of Prune Restaurant in the yes. Times. Beautiful. It was a really amazing article because what, what was really um, very clear and uh, deep about the article is how she sort of revealed what the um, economic um, situation was before COVID hit that made the entire industry so fragile and that the whole thing was riding on such, all these different restaurants. She talks about other people who ran restaurants kind of all saying, oh yeah, we're doing great. But when the time comes that the bottom fell out, nobody had any savings. Every, right. Everybody was riding on such a very thin um, margin. And I think that's really true for many arts institutions as well. You know, we've gotten used to the fact <clears throat> and torn page is no exception because we don't have any endowment. I don't have a trust fund I run it out of. We all basically hand to mouth every month just trying to keep the, the lights on. And, uh, you know, it's because of the way the um, economy works. Everybody's used to the fact that you just have to pay a very high level for, for keep the everything open and the real estate so expensive. And so, uh, you know, when something like this comes, it just you know, when the bottom falls out, there's no infrastructure to place to take care of things. This economy that, uh, you know, our president was so proud of was economy where they completely dismantled the safety net. So now they're scrambling to try to put something back together. But of course, the people who are getting the first handouts are the people who already have everything. So um, yeah, I think COVID has uh, revealed uh, that, you know, the curtain has moved up and we see uh, just how our society has been structured uh, not to take care of people. And, uh, you know, the, the government's taking care of the people who have the most first. So how do we move forward? You know, it's a lot of it is a, you know, once again, the community thing, you know, uh, we have to continue making our case. We have to keep reaching out and we have to, you know, just say that we are here, not because we're um, expressing our own sort of egos because uh, we have a community. And we have people that we, that we come together and there are other people who come to watch what, the, what that community puts on. And uh, it's, uh, it's not about individuals, but it's about all of us. Mm -hmm. How do you feel the support has been um, for the theater and the performing arts in New York City? Is it, was it structured right? Is it workable if there's no COVID or do you already feel something should change, should have been changed? Well, from our perspective, uh, which is unique, because we are one of, as you said, we're one of the largest cultural institutions in the city and certainly one of the two largest theaters. Um, the city does a, a really excellent job of supporting us, the cultural institutions group. They are a landlord, both at the Delacorte and uh, at 425 Lafayette. We pay 
a token rent for both of those. They cover our utilities at uh, 425 Lafayette. And my experience having spent much of my life in other cities is that New York is the one city in the United States that understands that the arts are central to its identity in the broadest sense. When people come to visit New York, they go to the theater, even if they never go to the theater where they're from, because they know going to the theater is one of the things you do in New York. It's part of New York's identity. So I, I have been, feel like we're very lucky in terms of city support. At the same time, um, we get negligent support from the state and from uh, and nothing really from the federal government. And we don't live in a society that as a whole is committed to egalitarian values. So we are always having to push against the tide to do anything for free. We're having to push against the tide to reach audiences that can't pay for it, that don't think of the theater as a commodity purchase, but rather as an experience to be had. And so in that way, I don't blame city government. I don't blame the, the way the city is structured. I blame the way capitalism is structured. I blame the values of the society as a whole, which uh, within which I think uh, New York City is uh, an oasis, not an oasis with enough water, but at least it has a, a different point of view than uh, much of the rest of the country. Um, there's a big difference, of course, between the way uh, institutions are supported in America and you know, other parts of the world. The idea, you know, um, um, federal support for the arts was pretty much dismantled by, um, you know, the NEA4 stuff. There's the, the fact that every year the federal government, um, you know, they try to present a budget that completely dissolves the, um, you know, the endowment for the arts and all that stuff. It's becoming this sort of, um, this political statement that we, that um, arts have to uh, sink or swim by a capitalist model. That what, you can't, you, can't, uh, you can't make a profit at it? Well, then it's worthless. You know, if you can't make a profit at it, then you're, you're, you're a loser and you should shut, you shut your shop down. Um, you know, it's just something uh, to think about. I mean, there's some um, there's advantages to the American model. You know, when uh, institutions um, have a great deal of support, say, you know, I, I talk to friends who work in Europe who feel sometimes that they just um, that there's kind of a uh, like a unconscious sort of uh, towing the line that has to be if they receive a certain amount of support. But you know, I, I, I'm very jealous, <laughs> very jealous of the fact that there seems to be uh, you know, more support you know, in, in different cultures. And meanwhile, here in this country, uh, it's become a political division. You know, it turns out that se it seems that caring for people in a pandemic is a progressive issue and the economy is a conservative issue. This is just another case of them trying to divide and conquer. I mean, they're both important issues for everybody. You know, we've got to take care of our people. You know, you can't um, you can't take care of people in this society if the hospitals are overwhelmed. On the other hand, we've got to take care of each other, just um, you know, bread and roses. So that's where we are. Um, there are some positive um, you know steps going forward. I mean, one thing we have to see is um, you know there's lots of states that are kind of rushing to reopen. It'll be uh, we'll get a lot of information pretty soon about whether that's uh, you know, whether that's going to be a disastrous move or not. Whether that's going to depend on, you know, what happens and then it's going to affect uh, what the future is for live performance. But, you know, you know, live performance in other places, you know, um, if they don't have a lot of cases, I could see people talking about it, but we're the epicenter of the COVID um, epidemic in the world currently. And we're also the epicenter of theatrical uh, work in America. This is Broadway, this is off-Broadway. These are places from the public theater to MySpace. And so uh, the question is, when when does Broadway reopen? When does the public reopen? Uh, when are people going to feel comfortable gathering in large numbers again? It's a real serious issue. And uh, I, you know, I want to be optimistic about it, but uh, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the problem looking forward is just the fact that nobody knows. This is a lot, uh, there's a lot we don't know yet. 
and uh, nobody wants to kind of project a future without knowing how it's actually going to go down. Oscar, any thoughts about the fall? Will we, do you think there's a chance even, or I don't know? Sure, sure there's a chance. But, you know, in this, uh, we're all in the same boat. I don't have any higher insight into when we're going to be able to reopen. What, what I know is that we will reopen when it is medically, legally, and ethically possible for us to reopen. Um, personally, I don't believe socially distanced theater is going to take place. I don't in any significant way. People are going to come and gather in a lot of theater until they are no longer scared that they're going to catch a deadly disease by doing so. And so I don't think, I mean, I applaud Barrington Stage who are this summer removing every other row and doing solo shows and doing all these mitigating factors. It's very considering, but I don't believe it's going to be a successful model. Um, once there's a cure, once there's a vaccine, once there's you know, absolutely excellent and easily available testing, one of those things is going to have to happen or herd immunity. One of those things is going to have to happen before the theater can really come back. And those things will happen. We just don't know when. We just don't know what the timing of it will be. When those things happen, the theater will be back. And right now, I think our job, something you were saying earlier on, Frank, it's twofold. And the one thing is during this period to provide all the value we can, as I think you were doing, Frank, with these Siegel talks, which are great. And, and, and Tony, the one thing I'd, I'd slightly take a different perspective on is I think the presence of a live audience in the same room is an absolutely core component of the theater, but also the experience that I've had with the Apple Family Play and now even with this right now, this is a, an event that's happening. It's an event with an audience. It's an event that's happening live between us. We're not physically present, but it hasn't been stripped of all theatrical power. It hasn't been stripped of all the community power. And one of the things that you know I, I've been able to tell from some very rare experience online is you can have a sense of community. It's different. It's not as satisfying. It's not as good as what we normally do. But still, it's there and it's real. And figuring out ways to pierce our bubbles and to, to make us less isolated while we're under quarantine is a noble and worthy thing for us to do. But then for an institution like ours, the other thing I have to do is I have to plan, not plan calendar, because I can't control the calendar, but plan activity, plan art, develop develop art that's ready to go so that when the moment comes when we can come back, that we can come back vigorously and powerfully and you know, spreading the value of theater and demonstrating the necessity of theater as broadly as we can. How is the mood around uh, the community of uh, public theater artists? What, what uh, I'm sure you have your ear very, very close to their hearts. Um, I, I how is the mood at the moment? I don't think it's that different from the rest of the world. Everybody is doing the best they can within a very, um, scary situation. The, uh, there are not, there are some people, there are not many people right now within our community who are experiencing immediate emergency economic situations. And we're figuring out ways and people are figuring out ways to keep their heads above water for right now. The scary thing is the cliff that's coming. There is going to come a point where the not, I, I know some people are in terrible trouble right now, but there's going to come a point soon where a lot of people are in economic trouble. And that's where I think we have to try to mobilize a society to help everybody. It, you know, yeah, part of, you know, Tony, I think about the, the PPP is, you know, a federal program to keep people employed. We did that with the with WPA in the 1930s. Yeah. In the yeah. 1930s, we had federal jobs programs directed at artists, not because they were artists, but because they were workers who needed jobs. And the federal government understood that keeping people working was a value in and of itself separate from any profit they made. And so I'm hoping that we've got the thin edge of the wedge into the national consciousness about that and that we'll be able to keep pushing on that. Yeah.
compared to, for example, Germany, where artists have health insurance, a special artist health insurance, depending on the income you make, you pay or you make a lot, you pay more, if not, you pay much less, but there's some kind of a basic payment. I think the city of Berlin with over a weekend handed out 5,000 euros to artists. Of course, it's all um, organized differently, but um, as uh, uh, Oscar also said, these are also systematic decisions that have been made to represent values. And values, I think this is what it shows have to change. It is not working. How it is working now, it is not serving um, the people and you know the people who also go to the public theater and um, and um, and they're the first hit. You know, who, who artists and uh, were the ones who were shut down first and perhaps will be the last ones to open. Our Hungarian uh, or Polish friends on Tia Warsaw said. Um, theater and massage salons uh, were closed right away, and, they, and it's written down, and they're going to open last. You know, <laughs> so interesting something with the, businesses. Yeah. yeah, with the body, you know, uh, to do. We we have we throw as Pasolini said, so we have to throw our bodies um, um, into into life. So, Oscar, do you think, and Tony, will there be uh, an online existence of theaters like you know we have in the big houses you have? Uh, Opera, dance, uh, drama. What's happening now? Will, will there be, you know, will you be teaching at MIT uh, Zoom theater? Will that will it become an independent part? Because twenty five thousand is a super big number, you know, to listen to. And these people will go to see the live show also. Like with music bands, you love to see the concert, but you still buy the DVD or the CD or like the music cassette. However far you went back. Um, so, but will there be, uh, are there plans for you, Tony or, or Oscar? Are you thinking about having that to be prepared, let's say even for the next virus? Well, you know, it's happening now. I mean, we all, all the people who are teaching classes went online, you know, there's a big little bit of a question about intro to acting. Um, how do you do that when you're not in the room with the students? But, um, you know, we all did it where I think it's going well. The students, I can tell, um, are very, very happy to be able to engage, uh, to, you know, not, be able, not have to lose their contact with their fellow students or the, we had to change the focus a little bit. And, uh, you know, a week into the shutdown, I found myself playing Falstaff in an adaption of Henry IV Part I that Plan Shakespeare is doing. And I was like, wow, this is great. I've always wanted to play Falstaff. I didn't expect it would be on Zoom, but here it is. <laughs> And then I was uh, I was directing a Zoom piece, this Heather Woodbury thing, um, uh, while the globe warms, and I found it I find it a very interesting beast aesthetically. You know, it's a uh, medium of close-ups. So um, you know, these interlocking close-ups, and it's really beautiful in the Nelson piece, but it can be done very other ways. And we spent a lot of our time in rehearsals talking about what the eye lines do. One of the strange things about video chatting is the idea that. Uh, eye contact is very strange. Like right now, uh, I'm looking at Oscar, I'm looking at Frank, I'm looking at the camera. How, where do you look when you're trying to communicate? Yeah. Yeah. These are very fast, it's actually a very fascinating medium. So when I say, I, sometimes I don't know if I wanna call it theater, it's not to downgrade it. I actually think it's, um, you know, right now we've got lots of actors who can't gather in rooms. And uh, it's hard to gather a big film production. Those film productions, you know, but um, using this uh, technology um, to these home cameras, um, there's kind of a new aesthetic and there's lots of amazing work being done in this field. So um, I'm very grateful for that. So, um, you know, um, we're all evolving, you know, um, you know, um, artists have to create. And uh, those of us who are used to creating in li live in rooms with other people, we're just um, using the materials that we have at our, at, at our fingertips and, uh, you know, having fun with the new puzzles and uh, um, having a great time working in the medium and watching work in the medium. So it's happening. Um, I think you know, one thing that'd be really exciting about the future of these live things is when we start moving to a more sort of live television aesthetic, I think it's gonna be a return to the glory days of the 50s. So um, how can we move, how can we kind of reinstitute a thing where maybe theater is being filmed and maybe they'll we'll get to a point where we're able to have actors in a room together, but they still you know, broadcast to a, an audience. And maybe that's something that just becomes regular even when the theaters are back on. Even if uh, something at the public theater is playing for an audience of 300 people, maybe it'll also be live streamed. So 
um, there's there's things about the current situation. Uh, you know, those of us who like a challenge, uh, we're all uh, taking the challenge to try to keep um, producing work and uh, sharing with our communities. Yeah, I completely agree with Tony. We, we're discovering there are certain things that work very well on Zoom or online. Uh, teaching is one of them. Uh, the classes that I'm teaching uh, in certain cases are better online than they were in person. For example, there's a class that I teach online now and I don't know why, but since we've moved to Zoom from the classroom, class participation has gone way up. Everybody mm -hmm. speaks now, whereas actually in the room, it tended to be much more dominated by a few people. Why is that? We can all have a theory about it, but I'm actually having the experience that that's what happens. So there's certain things we're learning that way. There's other, Susan Lee Parks, Watch Me Work, works brilliantly online. It's a wonderful thing to do online. Thanks to HowlRound for that too. Um, Richard Nelson is the first instance we have of a play that is written um, for Zoom about Zoom times, about quarantine times. And that's really worked. And that was what, 48 hours ago, less than 48 hours ago. 36 hours ago. So we're still trying to figure out what to learn from that. The fact we have had 25,000 views in 36 hours from, you know, it was the watching live over the mountains and it was 16 different countries. That's something the public's never had before. So what does that say to us? We, we have to recalculate that. I will be shocked if that learning doesn't go into the post COVID world, if we're not taking some things that we learn in this time and it is changing our practice um, without again, believing that the fundamental practice we have of bringing live audiences together with live actors to tell stories, that's still the fundamental business we're gonna be in. But I, I think there's some very um, exciting possibilities of expansion here. Yeah, so can people download now? Can they still look at it? Is it on the website? Or uh, yes, it's a, it, it, it will be streaming on the public theaters website until Sunday. And Sunday at a certain to, time or any time, any time you want, any time you want, from now till Sunday. Then we, uh, according to our union agreement, have to take it down. But it has been so popular that we are actively engaged with the union in discussions <clears throat> to uh, be able to keep it up online. Yeah. So it's, and I, I got to say, also in this time, uh, the unions that we deal with, uh, Actors Equity, 802, IATSE been fantastic about their flexibility. They've been really great partners because of course we're all on the same side. We're trying to figure out how to get work for artistic workers. And that's been, that's been a delight. Yeah. So something also might finally change in the year when it comes to screens and things. Yeah, it is true. It's a chance also for our Siegel talks. If we understand right for our talk with Milo Rao, we had over 5,000 listeners in 36 countries. Wow. Um, that's unheard of for a one hour talk that's just announced the week before. Wow. Um, and, um, and there seems to be um, um, something we can connect to. I, I think it's in a way uh, like communicating. You can write a handwritten letter. You can write an Instagram. You can write an email. You can send a text message or you write uh, an email. So there will be variations. Of course, the handwritten letter um, is um, a wonderful, precious thing. Um, I love to read books. Yes, I have an electronic device, but when I have a book, I enjoy it more than saying the same. We'll also be in a way, hopefully for theater, but we need new forms uh, for the new times uh, as a bright set who is behind you on one of the tourists in China plays. Oscar, what do you think? What would Brecht say about America, about the political, social situation? What needs to be done? It would be absolutely appalled at the continued ravages of commodity capitalism, uh, as indeed any Marxist is. The capitalism's ability to absorb almost anything and turn it into a commodity, its ability to turn all human relationships into transactional relationships is awe-inspiring. Capitalism, as, as Marx knew when he wrote the manifesto, is this force unlike anything in history and it has produced value and has produced immense destruction. What, if I can quote another philosopher, Michael Sandel from uh, Harvard said, we used to be a market economy and in the last 40 years we've become a market society where every, not just the economy, but everything in society is judged by its price tag. We believe that we can put metrics on everything. We can believe we can turn everything into a number. 
And that, I mean, Brecht would have been appalled by that. Um, and, and I say as if I know, but that's what I assume. What I know is that he also said, we have to make theater not based on the good old days, but based on the bad new days. It makes no sense to long for some other circumstance and wish we were in that circumstance. Our, we don't choose the times we're born into. We don't choose the, the challenges we're facing. The only choice we have is how we face them, how, what we do about it. And we're in an era, you were talking about Peter Sellers' evocation of the planet and the ecology. So if we stop using ecology as a metaphor for the theater community, but think of ecology in terms of the actual physical ecology of the planet we live on, climate change is a perfect example of a problem that capitalism is unable to deal with. There is nothing within the market model that would incentivize, allow, or even permit climate change to be actually coped with. It can only be coped with by collective action that's devoted to saving the planet, not to maximizing shareholder profit. And so that, if we are going to save the planet, it is going to force us to adopt a different set of values. And that's, that's what I think we have to look at right now is where are, are we're being driven into a moment in history where the incredibly creative destructive forces of capitalism are about to run their course. They're gonna cease being creative and only be destructive. And that's when we have to come up with some different models of social organization. And hopefully the theater can be part of that. Yeah, I think it can. And COVID is also shows <clears throat> it's a situation that capitalism is just very bad at handling. You know, that's, that's right, a thing. That's right. So, um, you know, there's two lessons to be taken from this. People will either come out and say, um, it's not worth it. It's not worth the economic disruption to keep people safe. Um, that's one point of view. The other point of view is that if we can see that there are some things that can't be dealt with through a uh, typical business capitalist privatization response, we have to acknowledge finally that there are some things that have to have a collective response. COVID is one of the, is a perfect example of this. Okay. You know, the, our, the, the society that was that we built and the one that's become even more leaning towards a purely capitalist model in the la last four years can't handle this. So um, maybe the lesson we can take is that we need to build a society that can handle things like this and can handle the even larger um, eventual collapse that will come if climate change goes unchecked. Yeah, the world has come uh, to a stop, a full break, a, a, like a high-speed car. And normally we all know you slow down before you stop, you know, you learn, you think it was no, no time, no break. And now things are, things are um, um, unpredictable. Perhaps it might be even the end of the oil industry. Uh, finally, who knows? It will be, uh, there will be serious, serious uh, uh, changes that come up. And, um, and as always, that's why theater and the arts are so significant. You know, they are mirrors. They are shaping our time, but also they do mirror it. So it will be important what you do, because whatever you do at, at the torn page or at the public, it will reflect a new thinking, a new way of doing things. And this is why it is um, so significant what you guys are doing, what solutions you will be finding. And one day people will study that. This is what artists did during or after. Um, Oscar, but also Tony, are you commissioning and work now? Do you keep artists afloat? Do you have a like a round table as they did after the opening of the wall? And but they said people from all walks of uh, East Germany they should come together. Do you have specialist team, or or do you are you so busy? I can only imagine how much work it is to run from a, from a, from afar an organization. But do you what do you do at the moment? Um, yes, we are commissioning and we're developing new work all the time. Um, we, along with our colleagues at Baltimore Center Stage, Willie Mammoth in DC and Long Wharf in New Haven, we've created this play at home project where we have each commissioned a couple of dozen writers to write 10 to 15 minute plays intended to be printed out and produced at home by individual people uh, who are are supposed to do their own plays rather than wait for us to do it. Uh, we've had uh, almost 10,000 downloads by now. That's been a really, really successful program. Uh, we've done things like Richard Nelson's play, which was um, 
uh, driven by Richard's own idea. And now that that has been so successful, we are aggressively commissioning a number of other plays in order to speak to the time of COVID, in order to talk during and from this time. And we hope to get those up quickly. And finally, it's worth mentioning that we are um, really actively scratching our heads and looking at how we can do Shakespeare in the Park this summer, um, or if not do Shakespeare in the Park because we can't do it live, find other ways to provide to the city what Shakespeare in the Park has provided in the past. And those will by necessity be digital ways of doing it and they will involve a lot of artists. So yeah, we're trying to keep working. At the same time, developing the shows that we have been in the pipeline that we've been developing for years that we will present in old fashioned theater when we can do that again. Mm. So you can use funds that perhaps you artistic funds you can use to keep artists working since um, you don't have production. Even so, it is the, one of the smallest parts, I'm sure, of the budget. But you are able to redistribute that to keep to keep artists. Um... That's that's a, that, let me let me do a slight correction. On that Frank, we're going to lose right now in this fiscal year between ten and twenty million dollars. Um, we are taking an enormous economic hit from this. All earned revenue has just stopped dead, of course, as of March 12th, including all of our revenue from Hamilton and from the various Hamilton companies around the world. And our contributed revenue has in the short run taken a huge hit. That's not only because of the lack of activities, because of what's happened to the stock market. So we are putting together a special fundraising campaign, an emergency fundraising campaign, which we'll announce within the next few weeks which is both to raise money just to support the infrastructure of the theater, to raise money to support the staff and artists who work at the theater. And finally, we'll also include a significant component that is for the freelance folks, artists, technicians, running crews, designers, who are part of our broader field. We can't do all of that, but we hope if we do some of it, it will be exemplary for other people to step up and try and support that broader community as well. Incredible. I hope you're successful. 10 to 20 millions in losses sounds like a death sentence. Normally, I really admire you that you will keep this up and we know the doors will open one day. But also, once your doors open in New York City, we will know things are back to normal. So this is why it is so significant that you keep it. Tony, um, are you... Um, are you uh, yeah, know, you, you, since you don't have any money, are you commissioning someone without any money, or uh, or do you well, say you know, it's a time of we wait and do you know, uh, we we have to move forward? You know, we're looking for ways to produce the shows of the community members that were canceled, like the Cold Hearts Eddie Poe and John Reed's La Pucelle. We're going to move forward with uh, um, work that can be seen online. Uh, Nancy Merlin's production of uh, Pinter's The Dumbwaiter that I'm performing in with. Uh, with Rolls Andre, we're going to do that in June. And uh, Emily King has written a piece about Dorothy Parker fighting words we're going to be developing. And, uh, you know, because we're like in our own small way, totally on our heels, like the public is, for the first time, we've got a fundraising uh, uh, link on our website. So go to tornpage.org. And, you know, everybody needs support right now. I think everybody is basic right now, everybody's just trying to figure out who of the many, many people they know who do they support? Well, you know, we need support as much as anybody else. So if anybody wants to donate to keep our lights on, we really appreciate it. Mm. And uh, stay, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to be presenting work in June. I'm really yeah. excited about it. Yeah. And anybody who listens from city government, federal government, you know, the institutions like the public city icons, they are like the empire state building uh, in the theater community. They do need support. They need the infrastructure that these buildings have, this is as significant, if not more, because it produces imagination. And if anything that is changing us is imagination, it is a, a failure actually of imaginations. A lot of the problems we do experience in this rise of nationalism and xenophobic thinking. Um, what are you guys reading at the moment? Are you listening to? Are you discovering something that you uh, haven't uh, well, thought of before? Is something exciting what you... Um, and and. Frank, I'm very sorry that I'm going to have to jump after this just because yeah. I'm so crowded. But yeah. I'm I'm rereading Watchmen, which is even better 30 years later than it was when I first read it. I'm uh, taking advantage of of all this uh, empty hours to read Thomas Piketty's Capitalism and Ideology, which weighing in at about 1,300 pages, I might have not started quite as quickly had I been working at my full time job. And uh, my wife and I are uh, just finished. Um, 
plot against America, which I think is Philip think Ross, yeah. his adaptation of Philip Ross, book, which I think is just brilliant. Amazing. It's spectacular. Yeah. Tony, it's going to be coming to an end. Uh, what do you. Yeah. I've actually been reading a book I've always wanted to look in into, Lottie Eisner's book, The Haunted Screen, about oh, the yeah. German, uh, um, you know, expressionist cinema. I mean, yeah. uh, I've just been really getting into that, you know, always loved the work of Fritz Lang. So now I'm digging deeper into like things like Pops Faust. And it's such an amazing universe. And it's kind of great sort of time traveling, too, to think about these artists basically building the film grammar in the 20s. So I'm loving that. Mm -hmm. I'm also reading a book about... Uh, the Carter family, the great uh, country uh, um, and pioneers. Country oh, pioneers. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, the Nosferatus are coming out. And uh, it, I think Antonio Cramsci said uh, uh, they are, uh, and the old hasn't gone yet and the new hasn't arrived in this gray area. The monsters um, are coming out and uh, this is something we have to fight and beauty can and poetry. And um, I hope you will join us um, next week. We have an all week uh, lineup uh, with uh, artists, women artists from around the world that will be um, uh, from Hungary to hear about this complex situation um, from um, Anna Lengel and Andrea Tompa. We will hear from Lola Arias from Argentina, uh, Micaela Dragan, a Roma actress and performer uh, together with uh, Mihaela uh, will come and to talk about the situation there. Uh, Suleha Alana from India uh, will talk again. We have a second part. It was such a, a heartbreaking call when we heard it from the situation there. Um, um, uh, Abhishek, who said he was uh, cooking for families in need and he had a list of a thousand people where he could deliver whatever he did in his home. And um, then we have uh, Stephanie Monceau from the uh, Ben with the Family Circus here in New York and the Double Edge Theater who are outside on a farm doing their work. What does it mean for those communities? So we will really hear from them. Both of you guys, thank you very, very much for, for taking the time to listen to it. It's important also for our international listeners to know what is going on. And, um, and thank you and for our audience. Thank you for taking the time to listen. We know how much um, you also have to do or we keep ourselves busy with so it means a lot to us we need good theater and performance but we also need a great audience that's what also makes theater that's what we see if there's no audience there's also no theater so um thank you for tuning in and to how at emerson college uh, thea travis and vj and uh, to the seagull scene here at the martin seagull theater center